Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to TED Talks Ball. I'm excited uh, here on a Getaway Wednesday to talk to Mark Adams, also known as at 49ers Camelot on Twitter and Instagram. He also ha just happens to be a writer for 49ers Web Zone, very highly prestigious 49ers publication on Twitter and other platforms. So, uh, Mark, thanks for joining me today. What else uh, would you like to tell people about where they can find you, what you're up to that I may have missed? Well, thanks for having me, Ted. We Every week, I do a 49ers mailbag for 49ers Web Zone. And that's a lot of fun because we get to see what the fans are thinking. And it's fun because when when there are wins, everybody's happy. And when there are losses, nobody's happy. And we get to hear a lot of stuff. And so it's pretty interesting. So I do that. Uh, open up that mailbag every Monday on uh, Twitter and Facebook. And then usually on Wednesday, we, we come out with it. And that way people can see it. And um, I also, every every day after the game i usually have a uh, just quick reflections you know some observations things that jumped out to me and so i do those every week and then uh, occasionally uh, we'll write something else but those two things keep me pretty busy um and doing different podcasts like this and and some radio shows and things like that but uh but yeah in the off season i'm a little more i'd say i write probably more of what I'm interested in writing where in uh, during the season, I try and keep it uh, based on the game that we just saw or the game that's coming up. Very cool. Well, I'm a big fan of your work. I also okay. was lucky enough to be on a podcast with you. I think it was Gina repping the Bay had a few of us on a little round table. That was a lot of fun. Maybe, maybe yeah. even twice we might've been. So uh, as soon as I got this off the ground and rolling, I was like, got to get Mark on TED Talks Ball. So thanks for coming to join me here today. I really appreciate My it. My pleasure. Love the name. Love the intro. Uh, you're doing a great job. Hey, thanks. Well, uh, yeah, for anyone who's watching, who's interested in like the uh, overlay you see here or the logo work that was done or the intro, uh, that was done by uh, at Roscoe's Mister is his handle on Twitter. His real name is Chris Haynes. Uh, he does a lot of work for a lot of content creators, and uh, so uh, you know, hit me in the DMs if you want to know more about him. I'd be happy to introduce you if you don't already know him. You probably do because he's a real big 49ers Spaces guy as well, too, and a big USC fan as well as the 49ers. Uh, so uh, for those who are fight on, I'm not a huge SC fan, but my wife went there, so I guess I have to put up with it. <laughs> so, Mark... Um, you know, the big, big thing on everyone's mind this week, obviously, is the big win uh, over the cards in Mexico City. Um, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on the game, how it went, what you're thinking going in, during, and since. Well, going in, I, I really felt like the 49ers were in a good spot. They had won two in a row. And really, the games that they've lost this season where early on they were really sloppy the kansas city game they were sloppy and they were injured the the bears game you know i i, I just don't i don't even know what to think about that one uh, the broncos game again same thing they should have won both of those games by double digits I'm, i mean they should have won convincingly so i really as, as they're getting healthier I, I felt good about this game you know the chargers game was kind of like the Rams game to me. It was sloppy in the first half and then dominant in the second half, uh, especially from a defensive point of view. And so I was wondering, you know, is this going to look the same? And right out of the gate, it did look like it was going to be the same, but the defense really turned, turned things around and the offense did as well. So I, I expected, I actually was kind of wanting Kyler Murray to be the quarterback because of what happened last year, um, I just felt like maybe, especially if he has a hamstring injury and he can't run as much, uh, that uh, that he may have been a little bit easier than Colt McCoy. Because uh, McCoy, I mean, he's good at those the short passing game. That's his bread and butter. And sometimes that gives the 49ers problems. Now, they... They did move the ball a lot, but they were able to, to stop uh, McCoy and, and the offense. Uh, I think DeAndre Hopkins, what, what, how many catches did he end up with? I didn't, 
I don't remember looking, but he had to. It was a lot. To, yeah, he had <laughs> to be uh, in double digits. But yeah, yeah, I feel good about it. I, I, the defense, we all expected what they what they were going to do, but offensively, that was what we've been waiting to see, and so that was exciting to to see that. Uh, yeah, I, I hate the Cardinals. I hate every team that's in the 49ers division, um, and so I I wish them all nothing but bad things you know i don't want them to get hurt but i wish them all to lose every game uh, that they can so always happy to beat them but offensively i was really encouraged no doubt about it uh thing lot to like in that game i just checked while you were talking sorry for uh, if i was a little distracted there but uh deandre hopkins had nine catches for 91 yards uh so i guess actually dorch Maybe he just had more yards. I saw his name ahead. I didn't mm-hmm. check. He had nine for a hundred and three yards. So yeah, that guy uh, was. So, so, so there, yeah, yeah. When he got that big one, I said, uh, "Our D just got torched by Dorch." <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, and the funny thing is, I had no idea who he was. I had never heard of him until probably that big catch. Well, he, I think he had one before that, and I was like, "Well, who's this guy?" And then later he gets the big one, and then he just kept making catches. And I'm thinking, come on, man. We can't get beat by a guy that I've never heard of coming into this game. No doubt. It kind of reminded me of, wasn't there some guy at Levi's last year in 2021 who did really, like, DeAndre Hopkins was out of that game. And and I think it was some guy like Wesley Person or somebody like that. Yeah, maybe so. And he really lit us up, too. It kind of mm-hmm. g- gave me visions of that. I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Here we go again. Some no-name right. guy. When we thought we had him down, you know, no Hollywood Brown. Uh, uh, Rondale Moore went out pretty early with that groin. Uh, so I was thinking, yeah, we, we should be able to corral these folks pretty easily. But, <laughs> yeah, and, and in fact, you were saying Colt played well. I thought he played really well. And even <clears throat> in that first drive when they went right down the field, and they almost scored a TD. Like I don't think the throw was the problem. I think the, his receiver, you know, it, it, he maybe should have laid out for it a little more or something. But it seemed catchable that ball. I don't. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't put that on Colt by any stretch of the imagination. So yeah, um, you know, I was with you. I I thought I'd rather have a, a hampered, uh, you know, hobbled maybe Kyler than than a fully healthy Colt McCoy. Now I wasn't one of those people like, oh, it's Colt. You know, look out, we can't win because yeah. you know, there's obviously a lot of reasons why he beat us in, in 2021. Uh, first and foremost, just being like half of our starters on defense were out. Um, we also had, uh, you know, a couple of lost fumbles, which is mm-hmm. very uncharacteristic for us. So, somebody had said to end some bad calls too and non calls. And so somebody had said, oh, well, that's just football. I said, well, no, not for the Niners. I don't recall the Niners ever having a game with two lost fumbles under Kyle, at least not in the last several years, not since 2019. So, yeah. One big, one big thing that I remember from that game that we didn't see Monday night was that last year, there were a lot of missed tackles in that Colt McCoy game. And when you have a quarterback, that's really good at the short passing game, you have to tackle. And Monday night they did Uh, last year. They didn't. and, And that was, That was a big difference and then of course this year offensively they uh, they they were really effective especially in the second half in the first half the 49ers were losing the uh not only the time of possession battle but the number of plays and they were losing those two stats by a lot and with that altitude i was really concerned at halftime that uh if the offense comes out and and does a three and out or something like that and the and then the defense has to start staying on the field a while then we could see this thing turn around fortunately the offense came out and just ran it down arizona's throat and that's exactly what we needed to see so yeah it kind of reminded me of that long drive against the rams week 10 of 2021 where it was just like so many runs and just yeah total physical domination it was so great to see yeah i was I, I was so happy that we went into the halftime with the lead, uh, 17 to 10, and that we were getting the kickoff in the second half. But like you, I, I was worried. Like I was like, we got to score, 
at least three on this drive and get it to 20 to 10, or ideally, like we did, score a touchdown, get it to 24 to 10. Yeah. Uh, that was huge, no doubt about it. So um, as far as, like, other things, like, uh, obviously, Jimmy G had one of his better games. Uh, do you want to talk specifically a little bit about him? Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on Jimmy G and how he played? I think that he especially the last three games, he has been really, really good. And I had somebody in our mailbag to, uh, that went out today ask if the presence of Brian Greasy has helped Jimmy Garoppolo. And we all know that Brian Greasy was hired to help Trey Lance, but has he in fact helped Jimmy Garoppolo more than what we thought? And I think probably the answer is yes. Uh, Garoppolo's taken more chances, more risks, um, yet he's not turning the ball over any more than he has in the past. In fact, he's turning it over less. And so I think that the biggest thing is Christian McCaffrey, and I'm sure we'll get to him here in a little bit. But yeah, I, I think that, that Garoppolo, is, he's just been a lot more efficient, a lot more effective. Uh, he's taking care of the ball uh, but yet he's taken some risks. And, and that play to uh, the, the first one that George Kittle scored on, where he started scrambling and, and then tossed it over the defense, that was, that was great because he's not known for those improvisational plays. And so to see him do it, I think, was, was really cool. Um, and, and I was very encouraged by that. So, yeah, I, I love what he's doing. Um, I, I still believe in Trey Lance, but right now I think that, uh, that Garoppolo is giving them the better uh, chance of winning and probably gives them the better chance of winning the Super Bowl, especially if he keeps playing this way. Uh, yeah, I love it. I mean, uh, I'll go through what you said, and, and I agree with, with most of it 100% as far as like, I love the, the pass to Kittle. I love that he broke contain. He could have run for a first. He didn't. He could have thrown short to McCaffrey for a little mm -hmm. bit more. He didn't. He went for it all with with Kittle. And, and it wasn't the most accurate pass, but it was accurate enough that, that Kittle was able to, you know, break a tackle and, and rumble in for, for that uh, first touchdown of his. Um, so, yeah, that was awesome. As far as Jimmy versus Lance, well, first of all, luckily, we don't have to worry about it right now. Um, but, you know, it sounds like Lance is healing faster than expected. So by the end of the season or by the, the playoffs, it could be a real conversation. I think, yeah, I mean, if Jimmy's playing like he was on Monday night, then yeah, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. our best option. However, um, you know, I just uh, uh, dropped my summary article today, and I was saying basically, like, Mm, there's a few red flags with me about Monday night. Uh, one, cards pasty, not that great overall for the season. They're like, I think they were 19th DVOA, uh, and their and their run D was a little better at 16th, but neither was you know good. Which, you know, their average or worse. But then, but then the cards D is also really banged up. Uh, they were missing Byron Murphy Jr., their uh, starting cornerback who goes alongside Marco Wilson. They were missing Richard Lawrence, who's probably their best defensive tackle. Uh, pretty much on that D line, it's like an aging JJ Watt is their mm -hmm. best, you know, most disruptive person. Yeah. And he just really doesn't have much help. So, you know, I don't know that we gave a lot of help to whoever was blocking him, but we certainly could have. Um, and so I would have to watch the film better to know that. But um, ultimately, like, I just want to see Jimmy do it versus a better defense versus a better team. I feel like a lot of his best performances, no fault of his own. You play who's in front of you. I get that. But but a lot were, you know, um, defenses that were missing a lot of secondary. Like Rams week four, they're missing Troy Hill and uh, David Long. Or I think that's his name. Uh, but they're cornerbacks two and three, mm -hmm. right, behind Ramsey. 
Um, you know, you look at the the Panthers game. He played well. They are missing both starting safeties, and Jeremy Chin is a stud safety too. He's not just any safety. Yeah. And I think their other safety, Xavier Woods, is pretty good too. Not only that, but then J.C. Horn, their star cornerback, who is a stud, went down at halftime and didn't play any in the second half. So that's three out of the four or five secondary members that were out. You know, and and like the Chargers were missing J.C. Jackson, also Joy Bosa on the line to apply pressure to make the secondary look better. Um, so. You know, so yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the Rams are a pretty good defense, like maybe in week eight they were, but then like Jimmy just always plays them pretty well. So I kind of throw that out the window. It's kind of mean maybe of me to do that, but, <laughs> but you know, I'm known as like a Jimmy G hater. I was known as like the big Jimmy G stand for a long time. And then I kind of flip flopped last year after the Green Bay game. I saw these teams playing these six man lines. And, and and it really became clear to me like we'd only get as far as we could kind of carry him. He seems to be playing better now, and I'll give him credit. You know, I, like I said, I think this is one of his best games. I just I hope he can continue it versus better D's, and I think we'll see a little bit better D this weekend with the Saints, and then obviously the Dolphins, and then the Bucks is one that, that scares me defensively wise. Obviously the Dolphins scare me off, of, but I don't want to get too much into that. We'll talk about that stuff later. Let's stick to uh, the game and. Um, as far as offensive line, give me your thoughts on the O-line. They they were really good, and usually that's the weakness of, of the team. But, you know, Aaron Banks has been great this year. Um, Burford has been up and down, but he's been more up than down. And they, they bring Brunskill in to – I'm still not sure why they do that. I don't have a problem with it because it's working, but – I'm not entirely sure why they do it. Usually, I pretty well every week will at some point write the phrase, Mike McGlinchey is terrible. But I, I didn't write that this week because I never heard his name. And, and uh, when I did pay attention to him, he was doing his job. Um, and, and then uh, Jake Brendel, I often will say Jake Brendel is terrible. <laughs> But Monday night, he was good, you know, and we all saw that block where uh, where Debo Samuel scored and Brendel was all the way down the field uh, moving people out of the way. And so, you know, I I, I wrote in, in the, our mailbag that, that I did today that I would be shocked if Brendel is the center, is the starting center next year. But I should have added that if he keeps improving – then then maybe he will be but this this is his first season to be a starter and the 49ers like him uh you know the the offensive line coach wanted him here kyle shanahan went out of his way uh, back i think it was in training camp to say something like um forrester wanted him so we got him and he's better than advertised so that gave me some hope and and so maybe early on it was just inexperience and he's you know i know he's been around a while but he hasn't been a starter for a while so i hope that he is getting better but i'll have to see you know once they start playing some some teams with better defensive lines uh, we'll see how that goes yeah i mean exactly teams with better defensive tackles i think still scare me but you know, I, the one thing I'll say about Brendel that I do like is, uh, is you know, he seems to be a pretty good pass blocker, uh, even if his run blocking isn't what we would hope. Um, so at least there's not, like, a, a straight line to Jimmy uh, for pass rushers. You know, the shortest distance is a straight line, and that's straight over the center. So that's that's one of the key areas you got to block in a pass block situation. So I'm at least yeah. happy with him for that. And, and, and you mentioned the whole Brunskill and, and Burford platooning. And I, like you, am a little bit at a loss uh, to try and explain it. I think um, at first I thought maybe they were just getting uh, Brunskill sort of into game shape since he had that, I think it was a hamstring injury late in camp there and through most of the beginning of the season. Um, then I thought maybe it was to replace Brendel at center, you know, that they wanted Bruns Brunskill to take his place. Uh, especially because they were kind of platooning in preseason at center and 
and, and it was pretty clear that, that Brunskill wasn't very good at snapping the ball. So I'm like, he must be much better at blocking if they're even wasting their time to see him do it. Because the first thing a center's got to do is snap the ball. I mean, that's, yeah. you got to get the ball to the quarterback or it's going to be a long day. Um, right. so, yeah, so, yeah, so I guess maybe their thought is, and see, see what you think of this, that maybe they're thinking, well, we're, we're getting Burford in early and he's getting meaningful reps and he's getting, he's sort of, most players have to sort of shed, I won't say baby fat, but college fat to become, to get that pro NFL body. It usually takes a year or two. So maybe he's getting enough experience to do that and to get better experience wise, but then they're, they're getting him rest so that he doesn't get tired mm -hmm. and expose him to getting blown up and hurt his confidence and hurt his stats and, you know, his reputation and all that. So maybe that's what it is. If, if, if it's not to move Brunskill to center, which it doesn't seem like that's the case now, um, maybe that's the reason why. Maybe he's getting enough of that advancement without risking him so much for, uh, you know, the negative uh, blowback or whatnot. Yeah, I think that could be. And it also could be that they're wanting to keep Brunskill um, ready and keep him in game shape in case he's needed somewhere. Somebody asked me in a mailbag uh, this week, is is Brendel still the center um, because Brunskill isn't ready or are they just waiting? And I, I, what I remember when Brunskill was the center was not anything positive. He wasn't very good at it. <laughs> yeah. I think that he's a good right guard. I think that uh, in 2019 when he had to play tackle, he was good. But as a center, he, he – he just wasn't. And so I think that they must be happy with Brendel right now and and really who's going to be better. So the, the thing to keep in mind is that the interior of this line, the, the left guard, the center, and the right guard were all new this year. So not necessarily new to the team, but new as starters together. And it takes an offensive line uh, some time to gel. I think – that uh, it's very po a positive sign where they're at right now because they they kind of weathered some some tough uh, weeks some tough games where they definitely you know they would have miscommunications where somebody would come through the line unblocked because uh, Burford went one way and and Brindle went the other and and so uh, if they start getting those things worked out and start uh, growing in experience then uh, this maybe the interior of, of the offensive line is not going to be the problem uh, come uh, postseason. It's sure not looking like it anymore. It's really encouraging to see, as you mentioned with McGlinchey, like, yeah, I mean, he's kind of been the four-letter word a lot of times, um, you know, and, and in a lot of these shows where where I've been asking, like, what are the weaknesses beyond, like, the usual stuff, like the fumbles, the drops, the penalties, you know, the, the mistakes, the sloppy play, like you mentioned in the Bears game, in the Broncos game. But beyond that, like what's slowing this offense down? Like, you know, we've got uh, arguably the best weapons in the NFL and, um, you, you know, the best weapons group, uh, not necessarily the best mm -hmm. at any one position. But as a whole, it's pretty hard to say that there's m much better out there besides, you know, Debo, Kittle, Ayuk. Uh, CMC, Elijah Mitchell, and, and Juice Check. I mean, that's just an amazing embarrassment of riches, yeah. in my opinion. So why weren't we scoring as much? And Kittle and I mean not Kittle, uh, Jimmy G and McGlinchey <clears throat> and Mick G came up a lot as answers. Um, and um, one thing that um, you know that I brought up and has obviously been a big talk talking point in social media last week. Uh, and then it, uh, it got so viral that it elevated to the national media uh, was the uh, Trent Williams tipping. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious to know where you stand on that. I, you know, when I first saw that and, and was watching, uh, you know, seeing the, the videos and the, and the, the still uh, photos from, uh, from the video, you know, I started thinking, gosh, you know, baseball, this is a big deal when a pitcher is tipping his pitches. Is this really a big deal for an offensive lineman? I can remember, um, I, I, I don't remember the situation, but I remember Frank Gore, somebody told Frank Gore that he was tipping 
um, based on how he, based on his stance or something that he was doing um, years ago. This, I don't, I don't even remember if it was with Harbaugh or before, but they, but somebody, somebody on another team told him, "Hey, you're tipping your pl- the plays," and so he changed what he was doing, um, and, and so. So I, you know, I was wondering, is this is this a thing? And then when Trent Williams explained how he explained it, you know, okay, if it's a run play, here's what they don't know. And then I was like, okay, yeah, he knows more than we do. Um, and then you look at there were there were some situations on Monday night where he was doing the same thing, and it it didn't matter. So. Um, yeah, defenses uh, are, are like offenses, and they're always going to be looking for just the slightest advantage. Uh, so, so yeah, I'd, I'd prefer that he not be doing that, but he's still probably the best left tackle in the league, you know, or right up there at least. Um, oh, absolutely. So I, I don't think that it's, it's going to hurt him that much. But in a big situation against a, a really good defense – yeah, I, I I would hope that maybe he'd hide things a little bit better. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I <clears throat> I don't think it's a a big deal, but like you said, in, in a league with a lot of parity, especially against a really good team, doesn't take a very big deal to tip the advantage. And I don't worry about Trent not being able to run block somebody or somebody bulldozing Trent on a pass rush, yeah. right? But you know, other people on the defense can see it too. Mm-hmm. And so, and so here's my thought was, um, there was a play against the San Diego Chargers, uh, the LA Chargers, the Chargers <laughs> last week on Sunday night football, where I was first and 10, Jimmy made a, a run fake and it was a naked bootleg. And the assumption was that Khalil Mack would bite on the run fake, follow the running back, at least enough for Jimmy to get out around him and throw the ball. And Khalil Mack didn't bite on it at all. And he just plastered Jimmy 10 yards deep. Uh, and and that's the type of play where you know us running on first down is pretty common. It's not like we tried to do it on third down and long where everybody already knows you're going to pass, right? Yeah. So so um, so I thought it might, might have had something to do with it there. Like, I don't think it's – yeah, like, like you said, I don't think it's a big deal. But I don't think it's nothing either. And just like you, I would hope that they would correct it or even more – what they may have done last night, since we had such a, uh, uh, sorry, not last night, but Monday night in Mexico City against the Cards, was they may have uh, started to reverse it a little bit to mess with people's heads, right? Like, so, may I, and I did see the one play I did pay attention to it. Trent had his left leg back in a pass set, and we did throw a screen to Debo to the right, and they were pretty much on. I think Debo got a little positive yardage just because it's Debo, mm-hmm. but it made me wonder, like, if he had lined up parallel or square to the line, if we might have gotten more. So, I, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to watch, and like, like I said, hopefully we can turn it to our advantage now and, and mix them up and, and do the opposite and uh, really mess with some de- defenses heads uh, as we move forward. Yeah, and I think that we have to remember that he was injured earlier in the season, and yeah. in coming back from that injury, he seemed a little bit slower at times when he would ha- have to get out into space. And so I've wondered if he was, you know, knowing he was just a, a, a tick slow, if he was cheating a little bit just to kind of get a head start. Saw the same thing from Nick Bosa when he returned from his injury, um, if I remember right, he, he jumped off sides, maybe it was like twice, like back. Yeah. He lined up, he lined up off sides twice. Yeah. And, that, was and, and that, if I remember right, that was the, his game back, uh, from injury it was from the girl. And so, yeah, so it was, it was almost like he knew that he was a tick slow. Let me try and, and get as close as I can get. And, and so I, I get it. You know, if, if you're, if you're feeling like, you need a little bit more of a of an advantage, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully Trent uh, in the in in the offensive uh, coaches can can get that corrected or switch it up or, or do whatever. No doubt about it. And I want to circle back. You had mentioned um, Brian Greasy and uh, CMC, and I, I've talked quite a bit about that in, in some of these shows recently. And that was some of the things me and my guests came up with too was um was uh 
I, I mean, I was sort of saying I thought maybe 50% Brian Greasy and 50% CMC because it definitely, when, when Christian McCaffrey got here, that's when Jimmy really started going through his progressions. I think because he knows that there's that pot of gold at the end. Uh, it, it gives him, he does a better job of going through his progressions properly. Mm-hmm. And so that was really good to see because I, I gave him a lot of grief, uh, even up to this season for being sort of a one read quarterback. And, uh, and, and he kind of was. And so it's good to see, it's good to see him growing and progressing. So I, I would sort of split the credit there. Uh, and it's funny when we're talking about, uh, tells and tips, tipping. Um, I had, uh, Larry Kruger on the show yesterday morning and he was mentioning that when he did some scouting, he did some scouting early in his career, uh, up for the CFL. And he said that there was a receiver that, they could, they, who had tells where, where basically he'd come out of the huddle and if he was strapping up his gloves, it was a pass. Mm-hmm. And if he wasn't, if they were open or kind of flapping in the breeze, then it was a run. And he said he even figured out that if he, if he st- double strapped him, it was a pass to him, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so that, you know, it is a thing and it is things that look at the people look for. And I think some people that were mad at Jesse about pointing it out, I think they're being a little bit narrow minded about it to think that if Jesse saw it, that <clears throat> these professional staffs with all these scouts that all they do is watch film of their opponents all day long, that they didn't see it too. I mean, I yeah. think that's, I think that's, yeah, that's you know, silly. I think it's better bring it out and, and, and let's, let's, even the offensive line coach for the Niners, I think said it was something. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, not huge, but but definitely not nothing either, right? Some mm-hmm. somewhere in that middle, in that gray or zone there. Yeah, like most things in life, right? Yeah. Things are rarely black and white. Yeah. Um, so, Mark, uh, what about uh, the defense? Um, did we talk much about them yet? I think. I think. Well, I, I mean, they they were really good. I I tell you, this this is weird because. Uh, Brian Rennick, who's with the 49ers Web Zone, he's one of our editors. He he was asking, and, and I don't know if he was doing this for a podcast or something he was writing, but he asked on Twitter, um, who's somebody that you wouldn't expect the 49ers to move on from in the offseason that you think they might? And I responded, Eric Armstead. This was early in the season. and uh, And he was like, oh, wow, I didn't think about that. Since Armstead has been out, I would like to change my answer because <laughs> I feel like they've really missed him. Um, yeah, I, I feel like we knew he was really good, especially when they had DeForest Buckner, um, and, and then he was, you know, he's been good since then as well. But man, since he's been out, that defensive front hasn't been quite as dominant as they normally are. And then you take Javon Kinlaw out, which he's unproven because he's hurt so much. Um, but, you know, I, I hope that I, – I, I would think Armstead will probably be back in the next couple of weeks. I, I don't think it will be this week, but I, I, I don't have any inside information. I'm just taking a guess. Uh, I, th- I think that Ken Lock could be later uh, down the road. But, but when they get Armstead back – I think that we're going to see that different defensive front be even stronger. I think that Drake Jackson is starting to play more and he's starting to play better. Um, Charles Amina, who was, was awesome Monday night. Um, and that was, they were playing without Ebucom. Uh, so I think that the, the, the defensive front, especially the defensive line, I think that they're going to be fine. The linebackers are going to be fine still a little worried about the secondary not so much the safety positions but the fact that jimmy ward's playing slot which he can do but that's not where he's at his best um and, and i i just i'm afraid diamador lenore played well um uh, monday night he had he had a really good game but man losing emmanuel mosley that uh that hurt and and i'm concerned that at some point whether it's against miami or somewhere in the playoffs um, or against the chiefs if the 49ers meet them or the bills in the super bowl that not having emmanuel mosley could be a big thing and so i was really hoping jason verrett could come back and be jason verrett that we expected but uh sadly that didn't happen but 
I feel good about the defense, but I also I just don't think that that here this season they've been well well early in the season they were on a historic uh, pace, uh, but we we knew that wasn't going to last. But I think some injuries have really hurt them, and so they're they're not quite as dominant as I would like them to be. However, if the offense picks up the slack, then uh, I think this team could could win the whole thing. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, I agree with you on Armstead, I, Kinlaw, both. I think they're big losses, especially in the run game uh, or run defense. Um, but even in, in the pass rushing, they eat double teams and they free up our edge guys to make more sacks. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I've always been a big Ar- Armstead fan, so I'm glad to see other people are starting to see that for sure. Um, as far as, um, yeah, Mosley, huge loss. Uh, Verrett, heartbreaking, especially because it's probably career ending, um, you know, given that it's his second Achilles and he's already had two ACLs too. It's rough. Uh, I do like Len- what Lenore's doing, but yeah, I think, you know, we didn't really get the test we were expecting from the Cardinals. Mm-hmm. As I'd already mentioned, Hollywood Brown didn't suit up and, and Rondell Moore, I don't think he made it out of the first quarter uh, healthy. Um, and so, um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I think, um, I, 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 yeah, it's interesting the Jimmy Ward at nickel thing He's obviously a great tackler. I think that's the big draw. I think Womack is better in coverage. But, you know, can he hold up in the run fit and in the tackling? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's sort of like, you know, job description number one. Oddly enough, you think that corners are supposed to cover first. But for us, I think run run stuffing for the corners. You stop the run first with our defense. Um So, yeah, I have some concerns. And, and yeah, we were uh, ranked number one in, in the league. But... Like you said, we knew that was going to change. When you said that, I was like, mm-hmm, yeah, I knew it was going to change because not even without the injuries, you know, we were playing some bad QBs and some, you know, bad offensive lines. And so I just assumed that once we started playing some better offenses that those, the, you know, the, the, those statistics maybe were slightly inflated by that. Um, yeah, well, and they were, on a, they were on a pace that was matching what the 85 Bears did. And right. this is not the 85 Bears defense. No. I've never no. seen one like like those guys. But, but yeah, I don't know if you noticed this, but I thought it was interesting. And it, this is meaningless, but it just caught my attention that every time I saw Jimmy Ward make a tackle, he immediately started looking at his arm afterward. And so I don't know if he's if he was having problems, if he was having pain or what, but I saw him do that several times and and every time i'd be like oh no is he hurt again um and and so maybe he's just making adjustments to something uh and i was reading too much in into it i don't know if you saw that but i I didn't but it wouldn't surprise me after having that broken hand it said that he uh i was looking up the practice report because we were talking about armstead uh so uh cam inman posted about 15 minutes ago that armstead was a dnp uh, so was Trent Williams, but that was for rest. So Armstead was his foot and ankle, as we'd expect. Mm-hmm. Ab- Abicom was limited, so at least he's getting back to practice. That's good. They said Ward, uh, Ward and Ward were fatigued. Both Wards, it sounds like. Fatigued? Um, yeah, fatigued. Hmm. Maybe from the altitude. Yeah. And Greenlaw, Greenlaw jammed something, which was I thought was his wrist. But you don't jam your wrist. Uh, maybe he jammed a finger and it looked like his wrist. I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah, there was that that one play that uh I don't know if he came back in after that, did he? I don't recall, but what I do recall was he was, you know, favoring his wrist. I tweeted it and then they were looking at him, looking at him, and by the time he walked off, his wrist wasn't like hanging or anything. He he was, you know, holding it properly, so I sort of thought maybe he was okay just even by the time he got off the field. Mm-hmm. Um so that appears to be the case, knock on wood. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah, and then, you know, obviously for the rest of the D, they had the third straight shutout uh, in the second half, which is great. Some of that, you know, I, I attribute to, um, you know, like Herbert being having his bell rung against the Chargers and the, and the cards just running out of gas because they didn't trade at altitude like we did. Um, 
And, and and I guess that's you know sort of what I would say uh, about about uh, Jimmy G doing well. Uh, cards D not great. Cards D banged up. Cards D didn't turn it out. Mm-hmm. So it goes for their offense too. Um, what about like uh, our weapons? I use Kittle and Debo. Uh, we talked a little bit about Kittle already with his rumbling TD there. Um, but what are your impressions on our big three weapons? I think Brandon Ayuk is the best receiver on the team. Uh, I'm not saying he's the best weapon. I think that McCaffrey and Debo uh, would would probably have to battle it out for that. But Ayuk is, man, his routes are filthy. And the guy, I know he dropped a, uh, that, that touchdown uh, against the Chargers, but he doesn't drop the ball normally and he also fumbled in that game he doesn't fumble and I, I think that was his second fumble that he lost in his career and so if they could ever get him op- like get him the ball in space then I because he is I feel like he runs some incredible routes gets open but they they run him inside a lot you know like in the middle and so there's usually somebody there pretty quick to to bring him down if they could ever slip him by like like uh john taylor jerry rice kind of kind of thing man he I, I think that he could really do some damage but i like i like iuk a lot and i man i i probably would lose a lot of uh, respect from people if i said that if they have to choose between iuk and debo they should they should keep iuk I, I might say that. Um, and, and partly it's because I don't know how long Debo can play. Uh, yeah. Just the way that he plays is so physical. Where Ayuk, I think, you know, he's a strong, wiry guy. And, and, uh, and, and so I like Ayuk. I really hope that when uh, his contract's going to be coming up, um, what they they extended Debo this this off season or this past off season? With, uh, see, he was a rookie in uh, two thousand nineteen. Yeah, twenty nineteen, and Ayuk was drafted in twenty twenty. So, yeah, I wonder if they're gonna try and extend Ayuk this off season. I well, hope the difference the difference between the two timelines is that uh, Ayuk round, was a f- yeah, first round right. pick, so he gets the fifth year option. Right. Where, whereas Debo was a second round pick, so we had to do it. You know. A year yeah. Earlier. So so then that buys them an extra year. So hopefully they can do something with him because I I really hope that they can keep him. Um, Kittle is Kittle. Um, he's. I I wish that Kittle would start running out of bounds or or whatever because he plays so physical like Debo and that that's what makes them special. But Kittle's not the same player he was even he, even two or three years ago, and so I, I just think that he, he has so much wear and tear on him. But love all three of those weapons; they're just they're amazing. No doubt about it. And with Ayuk. I mean, you were kind of hinting at this, you know, uh, not only does he not have those, you know, drops and, and turnovers with frequency, but there were some pretty good, you know, I'll call them facts. If you're a hater or an opponent, you call them excuses, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, the, the throw to Ayuk in the end zone was behind him. And I'll say that Jimmy put a little too much mustard on it, you know, and, and you know, he threw it a little too hard. You know, if you'd throw it with a little more touch and a little more in the bread basket, then I would blame Ayuk more for the drop. Uh, obviously, he's an NFL receiver. It, it did hit him in the hands. He should, you know, catch that more times than not. But I'm not going to beat him up too much because of those extenuating cir- circumstances. And then with the fumble, obviously, uh, you know, Derwin James went helmet to helmet on him. And again, some people will hold on to that. So you, you do blame him a little for, for letting go. But... But he, not nearly as much as if if it had been uh, mm-hmm. a, a clean hit, uh, a legal hit, let's say, yeah. because I, I thought that deserved every bit of a flag and or ejection as the Dre Greenlaw hit. So, um, yeah, and the way that he was kind of spun around and and slammed into him, you know, that's that's one of those unusual situations where you're 
you're probably going to fumble the ball when that happens. But especially when somebody's got you pinned from behind, they got your arms kind of pinned at your sides, and yeah, it's it's frustrating. And it happened to Elijah Mitchell in that game too, where a guy had him kind of arms pinned from behind, and and the linebacker or safety came in and speared him helmet to helmet too. So yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, really happy with all those guys. I mean, I don't make me choose between Debo and Ayuk. I hope we, I hope we <laughs> keep them both. Um, I do agree that Ayuk is a much better route runner. He has better hands. Um, and, and, and Debo is the better weapon. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then Kittle, I don't know how much he's lost. Or is it just, he's just been doing too much blocking. I mean, you know, we, we're starting to see him come around here in the last two, three games. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been saying all along, like, he just needs a better quarterback, and, and that quarterback needs better protection. So, no, you know, again, McGlinchey and Jimmy G, what do you know? For me, a, a lot of times it circles back to those two as the culprits. Um, and maybe that Trent Williams tipping, too. We'll see. Uh, if things keep improving, I'll, I'll keep harping back on that one, too. What about uh, Elijah Mitchell and CMC? Uh, they obviously you know, played well uh, Monday night. Give me your thoughts on those two guys. Here's what I think. First, I think that with Christian McCaffrey, and I've written this multiple times, that when... When I was, I, I wrote this uh, Roger Craig to the Hall of Fame story back in February. And when I was writing that, I talked with Larry Kruger a lot because he was the one that initially I heard throw out the facts. Uh, and, and so he was kind of making the case, and then I was taking it um, to the public for him. So with that, I talked to Matt Mayoko. Uh, he's a Hall of Fame voter, and I wanted to get his input on why maybe Roger Craig's not in the Hall of Fame. And so when when we were talking, Matt said that when he spoke to Bill Walsh before Walsh died, that Walsh told Matt that he wasn't able to entirely use his offense until he drafted Roger Craig, wow. which was a stunning thing for me to hear, that – Bill Walsh couldn't use his full offense until he had Roger Craig. So then I got thinking about um, when Mike Shanahan had Ricky Waters. And I even wrote this today that, you know, the first, the the third play of the game in Super Bowl 29, Jerry Rice catches a 40 something yard touchdown. Well, the next possession, Ricky Waters caught like a 55 yard touchdown. And that mm-hmm. was how Mike Shanahan used him as a huge weapon out of the out of the backfield. Steve Young has said multiple times that everybody talks about how the big mistake was not bringing back Deion Sanders, but in his opinion, the bigger mistake was not bringing back Ricky Waters. I With thought both. that yeah. at the time, I thought Ricky Waters was even a bigger loss than Dion was, even though Dion was the, the better player. And so... When I was doing the story, I I got a chance to talk to Joe Montana, and I asked. I told him what Matt Mayoko told me that Bill Walsh said, and I asked him why would Walsh say that he couldn't use his full offense until you guys had uh, Roger Craig, and he said because he could play everywhere. We could put we could line him out wide. We could put him in the slot. He could be in the backfield as a runner or as a receiver. So we didn't have to uh, make substitutions. We could just keep going. And because we're not substituting, the defense didn't have time to make substitutions. And so we always had a mismatch. That was a huge statement from Walsh and from Montana at how, why, why Roger Craig was so important. I see Christian McCaffrey as Kyle Shanahan's Roger Craig or Ricky Waters. I think that he can be used in the same way. I think that he's that dynamic. And so how does that work with McCaffrey and with Elijah Mitchell? I, what I see is Shanahan uses uh, McCaffrey when he needs to move the ball, when he needs to, to pick up first downs, when he needs to score and uses Elijah Mitchell when he needs to start punishing the defense and running the (laughs) clock. And the biggest complaint, that I have had against Shanahan and this offense is from um, the Super Bowl 
and from last year's NFC Championship game. Well, well, this year's, you know, the last season's NFC yeah. Championship game, where you go into the fourth quarter with a ten point lead, and you you need to start milking the clock, and instead it's just three and out, three and out, and we we know what happened both times. So for me. I think that they have lacked a, a running back who can just start milking that clock and, and picking up first downs and, and putting the game away. And so that's, I think that that's how he envisions using those two guys. And I feel like he's been waiting for somebody like Christian McCaffrey uh, to, to take his offense to the level that he wants to be able to take it just like Bill Walsh did when he got Roger Craig and Mike Shanahan did when he got Ricky Waters. So I would even add, my, uh, I would even add, I mean, couldn't we add Mike Shanahan in Denver when he got Terrell Davis too? Yeah. I, I think that he was a different type of running back. He was more of a pure Pounding. running back. He wasn't the weapon out of, they did use him uh, out of the backfield, but not down the field. Like that catch that Christian McCaffrey made in the end zone against the Rams, yeah. Ricky Waters made those kinds of catches. Roger Craig made those kinds of catches. Um, I don't remember Terrell Davis making that acrobatic kind of catch where you can line him out wide and he can do everything that a receiver can do. Um, I don't think they used Terrell Davis like that. Now, I could be wrong, but they... No, I think, you're, I think you're right. I just meant more like... Just needed, you know, a lot of time the Shanahan's are known for taking no-name backs and turning them into 1,000-yard backs yeah. or, you know, just productive, you know, high yards per carry, even if they don't end up with 1,000, if they don't have enough carries to get 1,000. And But, you know, for, uh, Mike had John Elway in Denver and couldn't get over the hump. All of a sudden they get Terrell Davis and they won two Super Bowls. So yeah, right. that, that was more the point. Not that they were exact players, but mm -hmm. like I, like what you're kind of saying, I always wondered what our offense would look like with a, quote unquote a real running back, right? Not, not one pulled off the scrap heap, a, an undrafted free agent or a late round draft pick, you know, but one who is a bona fide stud like a CMC, yeah. like an Alvin Kamara, uh, um, I'm blanking on the uh, Dalvin Cook. Um, you know the, these multifaceted receiver, mm -hmm. receive run receivers. I like to call them. <laughs> uh, I always wondered, and, and you know who I thought was going to be the one was Jet McKinnon. I thought he was going to be the one yeah. to to show us what this offense could really do. And kind of seeing it in Kansas City, sadly enough. But uh, he, you know, those two, there was ACL and his ACL setback really threw him threw him off with us unfortunately yeah i think that was the the probably shanahan's plan was to use him that way but i just he sure you know, paid him well enough for it right, right. I mean, yeah he did i mean those contracts the contract was whew, you know pretty, who another pretty hefty. one who another one was that uh, uh especially especially in the 80s a little bit in the 90s but marcus allen was the same way oh um, yeah they the, the raiders, raiders they would line him up all over the place and Marcus mm -hmm. was a, a quarterback in high school, so he could throw the ball. Um, and not like McCaffrey, hey, can you throw it? Yeah, I think I can. Oh, wait, yeah, I did. Touchdown. Marcus could legit throw and I think was even like the Raiders' emergency quarterback at some point in the 80s. But, uh, yeah, so he was used that way. And Walsh loved Marcus Allen. I you – know, if – if Walsh and those 49ers teams were playing today where free agency uh, was a bigger bigger thing, I wouldn't have been shocked if Walsh would have picked up Marcus Allen because because he loved Marcus. Uh, now he also of loved course. he loved John Elway too. He, he said that John Elway, if John Elway would have played for the 49ers instead of the Broncos, would have been the greatest quarterback of all time. Uh, so uh, that's uh, – I, I take everything that Walsh says. Now he wasn't perfect, you know. I mean, he did draft uh, Gio Carmazzi, uh, but <laughs> over over so, Tom Brady. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, people think of well, the Patriots were the only smart ones. The Patriots passed on him five times, so they weren't. Yeah. They, they got lucky. It wasn't. They nobody did. knew Brady was going to be Brady, but but yeah, I. That's how I see McCaffrey as Marcus Allen or Roger Craig. 
Um, those kinds of guys, Thurman Thomas, the Bills use Thurman Thomas all over the field. And those guys are weapons. Marshall Falk. Marshall Falk. Yeah. Tomlinson. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all these guys. Yeah, they're they're also just want to real quickly shout out uh, 40 under throwback says, hey, Mark. And hey. and uh, Bryant, Bryant Culp said uh, hi earlier, too. So I wanted to nice. call call him out just to say thanks, Bryant and, and 40 under throwback for showing up and commenting today. Yeah. Uh, let us know if you hear anything you like or don't like. Uh, let let us have it. I, you know, I, I, you don't have to don't have to agree with me. That's what I always say. I like. Uh, polite dissenting opinions are welcomed anytime. That's how I learn, you know. Yeah. I don't want to spread bad information, right? So right. So that's that's key. Uh, so all right, so good. So yeah, I mean, CMC really unlocked the D, uh, the offense part of me. Uh, Elijah Mitchell, the pound it back. I think I think you pretty much nailed it there. Uh, what about um, like outlook for the Saints preview coming up uh, this weekend? I haven't written my article yet, but. I, I'm going to start it soon, hopefully, so I can get it out before trying to spend most of the weekend with my family. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think the Saints are very good. And so uh, I think the 49ers are already double-digit favorite favorites. I uh, can't remember 10 points or something like that. Uh, I, saw, is, I think I saw nine and a half to open. I'll check it here while we're okay. talking, while, while you're um, talking. So I think that they should handle things. Now, the one thing that I am concerned about is that when the 49ers have done these things where they've gone to the East Coast and, and stayed on the East Coast uh, and come back, they didn't do that this time, but they did go to Colorado Springs and then to Mexico City. So it's a similar situation. On those trips, I, I think I heard Matt Barrows just a couple of days ago say that they're one and four coming back on those trips now one of those was the chiefs game and so we could you know if we throw that one out and just say that that was just miserable all the way around but the one win was if i if i remember this right was from 2019 against the steelers and they barely won that game five turnovers we had yeah yeah and so they have been sloppy when they've come back uh, from these road trips where they were gone longer than just a weekend and uh, and, and haven't uh, looked as good. So I hope, now I've, I heard, I think Matt Barrows said that Kyle Shanahan's really preaching that, that they can't let down, um, so we can't have that happen again. So it's going to be interesting. How, how did that elevation affect the team? Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, what both of the Ward brothers – are uh, missing today's practice because what was it? Uh, they're tired fatigued. or fatigued. Fatigued, okay. yeah. That that's concerning. Um, so yeah. is that is that going to be a factor um, on Sunday? So they should handle the Saints. They need to handle the Saints because of the fact that uh, that the next two games are going to be tough against the uh, the uh, Miami Dolphins and then uh, what is it? The Bucks after that. So it could so, be a trap game. Yeah. So this this game they need to they need to take care of business now. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I was over at my buddy's house, uh, John, and um, he is a season ticket holder. He takes me to you know a couple of three games a year usually, and then I usually watch most of the away games over at his house uh, since he's not at Levi's uh, for those. And um, uh, you know he said when you have your guests on tomorrow, which was yesterday. Um, be sure you mention to them like hey it's a short week and you know coming off a big win it could be a letdown and i was driving home and i got a text from him and he was it was a little clip of kyle's presser and kyle was like mimicking the exact same thing saying Mm -hmm. just like you said the the barrow said you know basically like don't let down you know we got to keep our intensity uh and it's a short week and and you know and the saints uh, while they're not necessarily a good team, they do have a pretty good defense. They've got some good weapons in uh, Chris Olave and uh, Alvin yeah. Kamara. Like we've mentioned him, is kind of in that same ilk as CMC. Uh, it doesn't take too many guys like that to take a game over. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think they have a good tight end. I don't know much about him, but uh, people on shows have mentioned repeatedly Jawan Johnson uh, is doing some good things, at least from a fantasy perspective. 
Uh, so, uh, and then obviously they have Jarvis Landry, who was kind of injured quite a bit. I think he's back. I think I saw he had a TD over the weekend. So, unless he got injured after that, I think he's back. So, uh, and what is yeah. Andy and the Red Rifle? Yeah, Andy Dalton, the Red Rifle. Uh, you know, he's not great, but he's he's kind of maybe like a peg below Jimmy G. I don't think he's. I don't think he's terrible. He's consistent. He's a vet. He, he shouldn't make any dumb mistakes. He's limited, but um, you know, I think there's a reason why he's starting over Jameis. He doesn't make those, uh, uh, right. you know, mistakes by trying to go for it too much. What do you think about their defense? I think they were supposed to be really good, but you know, I don't know what's happened. They must have had some injuries. Uh, I know, um, you know, that uh, uh, Marshawn Lattimore is one of the widely considered one of the best corners in the league. I think they have a real good safety. I thought that uh, Paulson Adebo on the other side, the cornerback, I thought he was supposed to be ascending young corner. Um, but I don't know what's going on maybe with their D-line or something because mm-hmm. they had Marcus Davenport on one side and I'm blanking on the really good defensive end. Um, but and, and I know they lost some DTs over the offseason. So maybe that's catching up with them. I, I, obviously, um, you know, it might be an issue for them too. And uh, I guess I'll give credit to Chiefs fans is uh, Taron Matthew, um, you know, was, was, you know, one of the top players in the league for a long time at safety. I think he's dropped off quite a bit. And the Chiefs mm-hmm. fans were saying they didn't think they'd miss him. And I, I know he's made a play or two here or there, but I don't think he's been the Taron Matthew, the, the honey badger, if you will. Yeah. That, that we all remember, especially like from the Super Bowl and stuff. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think that going into the Chargers game, everybody was talking about Austin Eckler and they really shut him down. So I think that if they can focus on uh, doing the same thing with, um, uh, gosh, I just went blank. Uh, the, the guy with us from the oh, Alvin Kamara. Yeah, Kamara. Then I think that you know if Charvarius Ward can can lock down uh, whichever receiver they throw out, uh, which of the the young guy that you mentioned earlier, he's he's really good. Um, Chris Olave, yeah, yeah so from Ohio State. If if Ward can can stay on him, I, I think that uh, with with Kamara, if they bottle him up, then I, I think they'll be in good shape. But but yeah, they they should beat. They they sh- they should beat the, uh, the the Saints convincingly, but it, it's good grief they're coming <laughs> off and of, coming off of that Monday night win. I know that was big for them. So. Yeah, no doubt. I would say I would say you know the other thing to keep in mind is the Saints typically don't travel well outside the dome or, or a dome. You know, so I think being outdoors at Levi's will be another advantage with without that hostile. Uh, you know, voodoo dome crowd egging them on. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that that'll be another disadvantage for them out here. <laughs> Levi's is, you know, I don't think that they travel uh, nearly as well as say like we do. Or, yeah. Well, nobody travels like us, but even you know, I, I think I think we'll have a pretty significant home field advantage against them. Yeah, I wrote in my mailbag that uh, that I hope this is an eighty style beatdown because in the eighties the 49ers used to kill the saints that's back when their fans wore the bags on their heads and yeah they were called the and then, and then they got the dome patrol and they were, they, they were pretty good against the rest of the league but we still just owned them to death so yeah yeah no ricky jackson and uh what was the short guy's name uh i think he just passed away sam mills is that his name sam mills yeah um ricky jackson was the big was, one there were two others um yeah those yeah, guys were think good of those two. They, they were they were good um yeah yeah, I'll, I gosh, I can't think of I can't think of them. But okay. and and then they had Bobby A. Bear was their quarterback, and he was oh, yeah he was feisty man. He would he he, he was, was a Louisiana native too, right? Yeah, he still works. Uh, I think that he calls their games or or does some radio stuff. I've heard him uh, on KNBR uh, in the past, but but yeah, right. he's uh, he was he was pretty decent quarterback. He wasn't very talented, but he was kind of just one of those guys that that somehow find found a way to get some things done. And, but, but usually it, it was, it was a blowout. No doubt. No doubt about it. I uh, also want to be mindful of your time, Mark. We're up over an hour five here. Um, are you doing okay for a few more minutes or do you need to get rolling? What's your, uh, um, I should be good for a few more minutes. 
Okay, I'll try and wrap things up quickly. You know, just the only the main thing else was like obviously there's the Saints. We're pretty locked up. We should win, but obviously any given Sunday, who knows? Yeah. Uh, and with the short week and the letdown, who knows? But uh, yeah, I, I feel good about us being favored. I think that's realistic. Yeah. Um. And then what about uh, just like rest of the season? We kind of talked about that, I guess, a little bit about the upcoming teams. Uh, where do you, and do you see us? Where do you see us record wise towards the end of the season? Uh, I think that, uh, if, if they can be, uh, I don't know if they'll get to 11 wins, um, or I, I don't think they'll get to 12. If they could get to 11, I think that'd be great. 10 probably still gets you in. Um, and so I, I kind of would think probably, uh, 10 and seven, something like that. Maybe, maybe 11 and six it just kind of depends on the, what kind of run they go on. I think that this Dolphins game is going to be really interesting. I think the Bucks game is going to be really important. And, and you know, what about that one that I think is going to be interesting, Jimmy G against Tom Brady. I think that Jimmy's going to be really motivated, and I think his teammates are going to be really motivated to, <laughs> to have him beat Tom Brady. Uh, but that Seahawks game, that's, that's going to be the big one. And so yeah. I think it's going to come down to that week. Um, and, and don't overlook the, uh, I think on Christmas Eve, they play, uh, Commanders. Washington. yeah, that, that team's good and mm-hmm. their defense is really good. And so that could be, if there's a chance, there's a chance, if, especially if the 49ers drop some games and Seattle is, uh, is, is right there with a chance to win the division and the 49ers are playing for that. There's a chance that that 49ers Washington game could be uh, that they could be playing that for uh, both teams trying to get into the postseason. Yeah. And, and in it's fact, looking it's meaningful. probably likely. So I think that's going to be a big one. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you on all those. Obviously, Seattle on a short week, tough to win there no matter what for us. I think we only won once in the last 10 years. I'd love to make it too, but wouldn't be shocked if we lose that. Wouldn't be shocked if we lose to, to the Dolphins. Uh, you know, and then. Um, Commanders looking good. The Bucks, you know, post divorce Brady's two and zero, and it's still Tom Brady. <laughs> Even if our team's wanting to beat him, he's still, you know, you gotta always watch yeah. out for him at the end of games. Um, but yeah, so there's like that four game stretch there that looks pretty rough. I think I think we should win at least two, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if somehow we dropped three of them. Um, so yeah, I, I could easily see eleven and six or ten seven. I'm right there with you, absolutely. And then, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. You, you, well, I more? just, I just think that this team, when they play like they're capable of playing, I really believe they could beat anybody in the NFC. The Chiefs and the Bills, we'll see. But defense travels, running games travel, and uh, you know the Bills, the Bills have that. Uh, the Chiefs, I don't, I don't think the Chiefs are as good as the Bills, but. I guess we'll we'll find that out, but I, I think that the 49ers could beat anybody, um, but they're they're going to have to play as well as they can play moving forward. No doubt about it. No, that's yeah. Uh, I, I definitely feel like the the Bills and Chiefs are the class of the AFC, one peg below. I've got the Dolphins, the Ravens, and maybe the Bengals. Maybe the Bengals. They might be a, another tier below. Uh, and then for the NFC, I've got, you know, Cowboys and Eagles right up there as the top teams along with us. Uh, I don't really see any other teams in the NFC mm-hmm. that are worth, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, the Vikings have some great weapons and Kirk Cousins is severely underrated. I think he's a very, very good QB, but uh, just not so much when the bright lights shine and, and the lights are pretty bright in the playoffs so yeah i just i just think dallas with that d and now they've got you know dak back and i think they're going to get obj too so i think they're going to end up with one of the better weapons groups along mm-hmm. with the eagles and and us uh it's going to be interesting to see though so um yeah, yeah. hopefully we get that uh, number three or number two seed that would be ideal so, yeah, probably a good time to wrap the show here. Uh, Mark, I really appreciate you coming on. Let me fly your banner here again for a minute so that everybody can know where to find you. Yeah, my but pleasure. If you, if you could uh, take us through it one more time, all about your mailbag and uh, WebZone and 
you know, obviously at, Cam, at 49ers Camelot on Twitter and Instagram. Um, yeah. Yeah, on 49erswebzone.com, if you find the uh, site staff uh, page and uh, and then just scroll down, you'll see me, and you can click on articles and find everything that I've written, and then you can uh, read through there and and uh, email me and complain about the things you don't like, and and I I usually will respond to people uh, when I when I see that, or just reach out to me uh, uh, at 49ers Camelot on Twitter. I like to. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I like the mailbag is that I, I really like the give and take, you know, and um, taking uh, questions from fans. And sometimes I'll even stick comments in there if I think that they're really uh, they, if they make a really good point or a really terrible point, um, I'll stick <laughs> them in there and make Uh-oh. fun of them. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you got your own receipts going. I'm not the only receipt guy. <laughs> then. I like it. Yeah, Good. and I do it just to have fun. I don't really do it to torment people. But uh, right. But yeah. It's, no, me neither. It's it's all. Most people get that too. They know it's all in good fun and just laugh. But yeah, no, that's cool. Um, well, good. Well, you know, I really appreciate appreciate you coming on. You're welcome to come back anytime. Hope we can figure out another time soon. And uh, good luck with all your endeavors, everybody. Follow Mark. Uh, please like and subscribe Ted Talks Ball here if you like what you saw. Bryant, Culp, and Foreign Outers Throwback, thanks for coming to visit. Everybody have a great day, a great uh, uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Eat lots of turkey, and let's go Niners. Let's beat those Saints. Yes.